This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 13 of the Stable Scoop Radio Show. How to take a better horse picture and what is chimping? Welcome to the Stable Scoop, with weekly shows delivered right to you. With Helena and Glenn the Geek, live from the stable, it's every week. They'll bring you the news through hay or hot water, while using their tails as their own fly swatters. So sit on down and laugh till your poop, cause it's time again for Stable School. Stable School. Stable School. I am Glenn the Geek. And I am Helena B. And this is the Stable Scoop Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network. Well, Helena, the last couple of weeks have been some really serious topics that we haven't had uh, we haven't had the chance to laugh and, and sit back and just relax because we were talking about cloning and also surviving the economy, which were not topics you really wanted to sit around and laugh about. Yeah. So this week and the next couple of weeks, I guarantee, are going to be fun. Uh, we're so looking forward to today. Everybody in their heart is an amateur photographer, or we think we are, and and. <laughs> Pretty much we all just think. Um, you know, we might get a good picture, you know, occasionally, but we don't know what we're doing and we just take shots. And now with digital cameras, you can just take all the shots in the world you want. So today we're just going to sit around and talk to a couple uh, people who don't stink at taking f- photographs of horses and some of our some of the industry leaders. And we're going to talk a little bit about photography and how to take a better horse picture. So that should be a lot of fun. Yep. Then in the next two episodes, over the next two weeks, you're not going to want to miss it because we're doing our Christmas gift guides. We're doing one episode uh, on English gifts and one episode on Western gifts. So that's going to be a lot of fun. We already have commitments from Rods uh, Western to do the Western side, and Rods is one of the biggest stores there is for Western gifts. And then also from Equestrian Collections, who who uh, I, I like, and uh, Chris from Equestrian Collections is going to come on with us and give us some help on what are the good hot new gifts for this year i love both of those uh those retailers I, and rods has the best catalog yes. ever yes ever. They, <laughs> for some reason talk about photography for some reason rods photography is fantastic like little things that you just want to buy yes like, it's great shopping it's in, for impulse buyers like yeah. me and probably 90 percent of the people who listen to our show and i'm excited the uh girl who's going to come on with us from rods uh but uh, her name, she's actually one of the buyers is Erica Bishop, and she's a lot of fun. I talked to her yesterday, and she's so excited about uh, p- promoting their top 10 gift uh, selections for the year. So that's going to be a lot of fun in the next two episodes. You don't want to miss that. But what are we doing today? Who's on today? Today, well, as you mentioned, it's the Horse Photography Show. And the goal for today's show is to help all of you budding horse photographers out there take a better horse picture. So by the end of the show, we hope to come up with the top 10 tips for taking better horse photos, whether you want to hang one over your fireplace, if you even have a fireplace, uh, or you want to sell a horse, um, maybe how to set up a shot so that you're getting the best possible side of, um, of a horse that's for sale. Um, and then we have a special co-host with us today, and she's going to help guide us into the world of horse photography. We'll introduce her in a minute. And then joining us a little later is leading equine photographer Scott Trees. He's known all over the world for his equine photography as well as some non-equine work, which is just its absolutely stunning. And at the end of the show, we'll be joined by a fellow named Tom Hahn, if I'm saying that properly. Um, Tom is with Porter's Camera, which is one of the leading camera shops in the country. And he'll give us a couple of camera recommendations for your holiday shopping or for yourself. Well, there you go. Good. Well, uh, I had been looking around when we were doing research for today's show on photography, and I came across a website called equinephotographers.org. And I actually contacted them, and Kareen Shippers, who's the one that runs equinephotographers.org, uh, got back to me and was kind enough to agree to come on today's show as a co-host. Now, Kareen graduated from uh, SUNY, how do you say that, Cobbleskill? 
Cobble skill. Cobble skill with an associate's degree in animal husbandry in 1977. And then after taking a year off, she actually attended the uh, New England School of Photography up your way in Boston for two years. Mm -hmm. So she sold her first horse photograph, I guess, in 1976. And she's been photographing horses ever since, Arabians and Morgans at shows. She does has done competitive trail rides, uh, carriage events, and dressage competitions. And uh, something else I want to ask her about as we get her on here. So, But in 2000 or 2001, she started this online discussion group for equine photographers, and she founded the Equine Photographers Network. So hi, Kareen. How are you? Hi guys, thanks for having me on. It was, uh, it was. Uh, I think you're going to find out a lot about photography today that hopefully will your listeners will find helpful. Well, good because you know, was I right? We all think we're a photographer at heart. Well, I, you know, <laughs> horses are just screened to be photographed. So, <laughs> good point. And I think I have the greatest job in the world, being able to photograph them and get paid for them at the same time. So. Well, that's true. That's true. Most of us just uh, try and photograph them, and and that's it. <clears throat> How did right. it feel I, you, when Glenn was reading your bio and he said that you sold your first photos in 1976? How did it feel to have your own, your your own money in exchange for your photograph? That must have been fabulous. Yeah, it. it um, I've really been very lucky, as I as I mentioned in my bio. I started taking pictures of the lessons at the stable where I was taking lessons, and the instructor would use the photos as uh, training for her students to show them the rights and wrongs over fences and their equitations. So right from the beginning, I saw that there was a real need for good photos that people could use, not just for their training, but also to uh, use it, you know, for memories, for going to shows or new foals or their children or whatever. And um, it kind of, the the whole thing kind of took on a life of its own. And, um, you know, I've been taking photos ever since. And it, it gets. I think it gets to be more of an addiction as I get older. The need to take photos. <laughs> well, you know what? You too. Back in 1976, you weren't using any digital camera. <laughs> no, digital was not even. You a were wasting a lot yet. of film back then. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. And um, we'll talk about the the move to digital has been really huge in photography in the horse world, and it's it's really changed the whole dynamic of equine photography as well as. Um, it, it really affects the event photographers out there, but now everybody has a digital camera, and uh, it's it's really uh, the instant feedback you get from seeing your photos is is really great and really helps people to improve their photography because you see right away if you got that moment or not. When we were shooting film, you you shot your 36 exposure roll and sent it off to get processed. And yeah. Then yeah, I don't think the younger people appreciate went. that. We used to have to wait for a week or two oh, yeah. to see our pictures. <laughs> I know. Now you see little five-year-old children, uh, what we call chimping, looking at the back of their camera to see how their photo <laughs> turned out. So what do you call it? I, I, I still have one film camera that I shoot very rarely now, and when I take a picture, I'll automatically look at the back of the camera and then realize, <laughs> wait a minute, this is not a, not a <laughs> this what, camera. What do they so, call it? <laughs> you get into that habit of immediately looking at your what you took, you know? <laughs> so what did you call it? Chimping? Jimping, it's yeah. You look at you look at your picture and you go ooh ooh ah ah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I like that. Guilty. And when you get a group of photographers together, you'll see a lot of chimping going on. <laughs> well, that's a new one for me. That's, yeah, that, that's, hey, that's a photographic term. <laughs> I got to get that in the name of today's show, chimping. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll get to work on that. You guys yeah. talk. I'll go figure out a good title. <laughs> so then you must have – I know a lot of horse photographers mm-hmm. that I've talked to through the years at shows and stuff were really – some of them were just resisting the whole digital thing. You must have gotten on board because way back in 2000, you started – started the online discussion group, which led to equinephotographers.org. Right. Well, I resisted also. I mean, you, as a photographer, you, you get into a certain workflow with your work, and you get very comfortable with it, and digital was a whole new new thing, and, it, you know, it, it's a huge learning curve. And, um, you know, I, I've only been digital for five years, so when I started the discussion group, I was still shooting film, but I was seeing a lot of my colleagues shooting digital, and we would go to workshops or whatever together, and I would see them downloading their pictures, and I would have my rolls of film, and I'd have to wait. So, I, you know, you could see it coming, the whole digital age, and um, now just about all the equine photographers are digital just because it's expected, especially at the events. Um, the big events, people want to see their photos right away, and really the only way to do that now is with digital 
and it's really it it really has changed the way the whole business uh, is run now and um the the old time photographers have really had to make some big changes to stay in the game and a lot of them that haven't made the changes have um lost a lot of work because there's been people with the with their digital cameras ready to to step in, you know. So so, um, so, so what is we are, e- we are seeing a big upheaval as far as how um, events are photographed. So what is equinephotographers.org? Well, I started it out basically as uh, an online Yahoo discussion group in 2000. Um, I had been shooting. Oh, there's for... a there's a thing from the past too. Yahoo discussion groups. Yeah, well, they're yeah. still around, but are they? we no longer are based at <laughs> Yahoo. But we started it basically as a support group because um, we're so specialized that a lot of us have the same issues, the same problems, the same challenges that come up with nobody that really we can bounce our ideas off of. So I started the the discussion group in 2000, and it was very active right away. And at the about the same time, there was no real resource online for people to go and find a photographer. And, and I would always get calls for shows, and then if I couldn't do them, I had no, no resource to send them to. So it originally started out as a directory for equine photographers online that people could go look for an equine photographer in their area. And we started out in 2001 with... I think we had 53 uh, founding members at that time, and it's grown from there. Um, we, you know, we've added a lot of things as we've gone along, but it was originally just a directory and a discussion group. Then we, uh, we also have galleries, and now, um, you know, seven years later, we have a newsletter, we have workshops, we have online courses, we have a very dis- uh, active discussion forum, and. We've also changed it so that we're open to all levels of photographers. Um, anybody that loves horses and photography or anybody that wants to learn more is welcome to join us. We have so a, you don't have to be a pro to join? No, absolutely okay. not. We have a level of membership called the general uh, level, and those people who want to learn more may join, and um, they can actually take a 30-day free trial and get in on our discussion forum and see what we're all about. And then if they decide to join this, some extra benefits, they can get on our assistance list and they get our mailings and so forth we have sponsors that give us discounts and so forth and we have grown um to over 500 members at this point wow. we have one member in russia we have uh, uh quite a few in europe um south america australia most of our members are in the u.s and canada but the beauty of the discussion forum is that you know we can communicate with people from all over the world and we can try to educate some of our starting pro photographers on exactly how to run a business and um, when you get Scott on he can talk a little more about that because he's running one of our online courses right now about the business of equine photography and I you know when I started out I did go to the New England School of Photography but they didn't teach that much about the business end. we all love to take the pictures but the business is what well that's are. true you know that's true of any horse business <laughs> exactly and so we had we that discussion started... last week didn't we Helena yeah, we did. <laughs> business is very hard and especially when you're doing something you love you almost feel guilty about charging money for it you know mm-hmm. so we kind of have to change their mindset as far as um, how how to go about setting up a business, being business like, you know, getting fair prices, not letting people walk over you, and then also educating them about licensing and copyright and things like that. So it's an on, it's you know, and what we find with our members, we get m- very many of the same issues that come up, and so it's almost like a mentoring program where some of those of us that have been in business for a long time can kind of help the ones that are coming up, which I never had. You know, I kind of learned everything the hard way. And so, you know, they, they kind of get validated for sometimes feeling a little frustrated about, you know, things that might not be going well. And I wanted so. to tell people you have to go there. Some of the photography, Lena and I were talking about it before the show, some of the photography on there is just unbelievable. And you can actually buy yeah. the prints there, too. Yeah, um, yeah. And- we have some incredibly talented members. And the beauty of EPNet is that we have so many different backgrounds. So, you know, we have fine art photographers. We have... Um, event photographers, we have portrait photographers, so there's something for everyone, and, um, you know, we, we can all learn and we all grow, because some of us may only shoot shows, but we, you know, we, we may never have thought of shooting like a rodeo or something like that, so we kind of see what everybody else is doing, and it's it's a very supportive atmosphere as far as people helping and, and um, networking, because that's, you know, that's it. First and foremost, it is a network for people to find each other and make connections, and 
it's been amazing how the whole thing has taken off over the last six years and actually turned into a full-time job for me where I thought it was just going to be a little website, you know? Right. Well, all right. <laughs> I have to think it's Good. a great resource to have all of these um, photographers and their, their work in one place, especially for me working with um, – helping horse businesses to market their businesses, one of the things that I think is absolutely critical to getting a message across about a horse business is you, the use of a photograph. And right. there are there's so many bad f- photographs out there. Like Glenn said, everybody thinks that they're a, you know, a horse photographer. Um, so you have, so coming here to, as you call it, EP. By the way, I include myself in that. Glenn, you're, you're <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, I think you're a great photographer. Oh, thanks. Um, thanks, Alina. It's She's because, just you know, buttering me up. She wants her paycheck next week. Um, <laughs> well, maybe after today you'll be even better. Well, then, that's what I, well, let's on that note, let's get Scott on and let's start talking about how to take a better horse picture. I just wanted to say one more yeah. thing about what Helena just said is we do have a, a resource for our pro members, which is called the Image and Photographer Request Forms, and we got a number of um, catalog and commercial buyers that come specifically to our site looking for certain photos. So we've made some great connections that way and. Many of the uh, images that you see in your magazines and catalogs are because people have come to EPNet looking for, you know, either through the portfolios or um, finding a member or uh, using the request form. So it's it's a great resource for professional photographers to be a member of because the image buyers are coming to our site. And, um, you know, it really is the, the, the best place to go if somebody's looking for images. So. Well, that's great. It's you've a done a plug, you've know. done you've done a great thing here. It's 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 got it all. If you it's a one stop shop, and you can find local photographers in your local area too. Like if you want to yeah, get a portrait done us, for Christmas. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, you've done a great job. All right, let's get Scott on here, and let's let's help let's help me take a better horse picture. Okay, uh, we'll try. Scott uh, Trees is from Scott Trees Photography and Trees Media, and the website is trees, T-R-E-E-S, media.com. He's one of the leading equine photographers in the world. Uh, he travels all over the world. Matter of fact, I think he's packing to leave the country right now, um, which I thought was interesting because the election was yesterday. But, uh, <laughs> but he isn't limited to just equine photography. He takes amazing shots of the most amazing things around the world. And I want to get Scott on here. Hi, Scott. Hi, Glenn. How are you doing? Good. We're so happy to have you on today, and I appreciate you taking the time. I know you are packing. Where are you heading off to this time? I'm heading off to Dubai. Uh, I've got to um, be over there for six months working and doing a variety of work, not just horses, but a lot of commercial work as well. Wow. Six months in Dubai. I thought you six were going over for Dubai. like a week. <laughs> nope. Nope. This is, it's a great time to be over there, and so uh, it's, this is kind of their... The weather there now is kind of like living in Santa Barbara until May, and then it gets hot, and that's when I come home. <laughs> <laughs> so you live in Texas, right? Yeah. I live in Texas. I live south okay. of Fort Worth. When I'm here, most of the time I live in an airport somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you have some amazing pictures, actually, of Dubai and, and that hotel they built and, and yes, stuff. Yes, thank it, you. It's, yeah, it's it's a pretty amazing place, and it 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 uh, it's funny. I actually started off wanting to be an architectural photographer, but but I grew up with horses, and the horse thing kind of <laughs> took its its own course in life, and 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 gave me a great career opportunity. Um, and I've had the good fortune to photograph horses all over the world. And um, but then I was doing a a, a, um, a photographic session for uh, one of the sh- ruling sheikhs in Sharjah, and with his horses, and was invited into the palace and uh, asked if I could take pictures, not realizing that they didn't even allow cameras in the picture in the palace. And so I did, and he liked what I did and asked if I'd shoot a book for him of the palace. And oh, so wow. that sort of started a whole wave of, of doing architectural work over there, which has been fun. But Now, how cool horses, is that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but that's, that's the great thing about horses. I mean, and, and the incredible thing about photographing horses and and uh i'm i'm going to be the featured artist at the kentucky horse park international museum next year and uh, in their gallery oh really congratulations and, yeah. that's fabulous You're right in my neck of the woods we're here in lexington so and well, i can just imagine show, that conversation you know oh i was walking through the castle one day yeah, and the shape yeah. like my my <laughs> photographs and <laughs> and, and well, there i really was off to dubai for another six months yeah it was really kind, so it almost cool. happened that way <laughs> <laughs> it was like, oh, by the way, I like these. Would you would you um, be interested in doing a book for the palace? Well, let me think about it. Okay, yeah, I think yeah, I'll do it. I think I can do um, that. But um, but the theme of the show is going to be because of horses, and and it's actually that uh, because of horses, I've had a remarkable career um, and a remarkable life, and in places that I've been able to travel, and the people I've met, and the horses I've met, and the places I've seen. I mean, I was in communist Russia, communist Poland. Um, you know, I've been 
I think on a f- figured four of the seven continents and, and um, shooting in uh, all over the world. And so it's been it's been great. And well, I, I love the, the pictures of you on your website because you look like mm-hmm. the, you look like this world traveler, um, almost Indiana Jones character. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, you you learned it to try and pack light and travel light. Although it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's I, I kind of like to wear the clothes that I can shower and wash at the same time. So uh, <laughs> you know, you, you learn to do that. Well, it definitely gets that kind of feel. So you actually became known as a photographer shooting horses, didn't you? Wasn't that first? Yes, I did. That yeah. really started my career. Um, I actually started taking pictures in college. I picked up a camera for the first time in college. And photographed fraternity and sorority parties just so I could make money, and I made a killing. Um, and I actually paid for school doing that. And, and now you then, can sell those pictures online and make money. Oh, yeah, I probably yes. could now. You know, remember when you said, don't take that picture while I'm back, um, and you're running for office. But um, it, um, it's, it's That's why he's going to Dubai. That, yeah, really. It, but I, it's... Um, so I, my, I grew up in the horse industry. My mother had world champion saddlebreds, and my brother had world champion quarter horses, and we had Arabian horses, and I showed. And so the horse thing was always in my, in my background. And I started photographing horses kind of just because I wanted to take pictures. I mean, my, my degree was in psychology. I've never had a, a formal training in, in photography, just I'm kind of a jump in, learn how to swim guy, and learn how to swim fast so you don't drown. But um, And so it kind of, after I graduated from college, I wanted to do um, – photography and and um started doing some horse shows and and you know use those to to um get things going and got tired of that quickly and started doing more commercial work and and uttered the famous last words i'll never photograph another horse as long as i live and so um I then got enticed back into doing horses, actually by, I lived in North Carolina at the time, and, and a film uh, company that had seen one of my presentations asked if I'd ever thought about shooting film on horses, and I said, well, actually, I had. So I started coming to Dallas for a couple weeks every month and shooting um, film of horses and some other things, and then um, this gentleman was <clears throat> doing some brochures for farms, and this was in the 80s when the Arabian industry was just booming, or beginning to boom, actually. And a big farm was having a dispersal sale, and they wanted something different for the catalog. And so I, they hired me, and at that point, turning the horses loose as opposed to just standing them up in headshots or body shots was very innovative. And the the, the catalog was a big hit, and, the, and it just took off. And I had um, a new look, uh, and I'm kind of known for what I do with lighting and, and situations I put horses in. They're a little bit extreme sometimes, and... and um, it just boomed. I mean, the, the industry boomed and, and business boomed and, and, you know, it just took off from there. And here you are. I mean, I've had my highs and lows. I mean, I've been doing this longer than I care to admit, but I think I'm being rediscovered for about the fourth time in my career now. <laughs> and, um, you know, you just, you have that as an artist. You have, you have points. I mean, I turned out a prodigious body of work from 1983 to 1994. Um, and I mean, it was a time when any, anything that you could conceive of, somebody would pay to do it. I mean, it was amazing. And, All right. um, so well, you know pay. what, um, you, you, we, we have both of you on and we don't want to miss the opportunity to really talk about how the average person can take a better picture, how right. the average horse person can do that. So we do have some questions for both of you. Kareen, are you okay. still with okay. us? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep, good. I'm still here. All right. I um, Scott would do most of the talking, so. <laughs> She actually told us that before the interview. No, she knows me well. <laughs> so, so, so what? What? What is the biggest mistake that people make? Let's start there, well, and then we'll go into how to do it right. I, I teach a very active online course for the basics of equine photography once a year, and there are three things that I always tell my students, and it always meets with a little bit of resistance. But once they start doing these things, you see a huge improvement in their work. The first thing is very obvious, but it's probably the most resistant thing, is to sit down and read their manual. Understanding how your camera works is really pretty critical because a lot of people think they can just put their camera on auto and let the camera do all the work, and that's a big mistake. So they have to read their manual, and then they've got to take it out of auto mode. Once they take it out of auto mode, I try to have them shoot either in shutter priority or aperture priority. That way you have a little control over what your camera is doing, and it it gives you a little understanding of what you need. With action shots, you need to have a high shutter speed, and usually if you set it on auto, you have no control over that. 
Jeez, she's got thing. me nervous already, Helena. It makes me really nervous when I turn that <laughs> dial off of auto. Are you taking notes? No. I start to sweat, you know? Yeah, and a lot of people are very afraid to take it out of auto mode. But I'm one of those. It's a huge difference in your work. Just put it on either shutter or aperture priority and shoot that way for a while. You know, I and did read the manual, though. Good. I never did go. anything about it, but no, I read it. Better. You're better it's than 90% like, of the people yeah. out there. <laughs> But it's Most, easier to you, know, you can make I, mistakes. I try, when I get a new camera, I'll sit down with the manual and I'll try to learn one or two new things every day, and then just play with the buttons and the dials, just just so you're a little more comfortable with it. So when you need to change something, you kind of have an idea where to go. It's really not that complicated. And I shoot Nikon, and I find that their um, their manual and their help um, in the menus is is very easy for me. And I'm not one that is great at following written instructions. So, so if I can need, do it, anybody can do it. Do you need and an expensive think, camera to take good pictures? What's that? Do you need an expensive camera to take good pictures? Well, if you want a digital camera, you, you are going to spend some money because the main thing that you see with the cheaper ca- digital cameras is the shutter lag, which you can't have that for horse photography. Um, the Nikons and the Canons that most of the serious amateurs and pro photographers are shooting with, are you're probably going to look at about $1,000 for a body. Um, now, what, you know, what do you mean by shutter? Let's explain what you mean by shutter lag before we go on. Well, it's from the time that you depress the shutter to the time that the, the camera actually takes the photo. So if you're trying to hit a horse with its ears up or at the point of stride or over a fence, you need an instant, almost instantaneous response from your shutter. And the lesser the lower cameras end, won't do that. The lower-end cameras what? have a very you know, noticeable shutter lag. So by the time you take the picture, the horse has already uh, gone over the fence, in other words. Yeah, I've had that a few When times. you're photographing yeah. horses, you're truly dealing in milliseconds. If you right. take, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that, well, with these, especially these newer cameras that can shoot 5, 8, 10 frames a second, I can just hold the button down and get the picture. And the reality is, is if you look at a, at, at a, at a frame of video, uh, a clip of video, a video shoots at 30 frames a second. And if you go through each frame by frame of those 30 frames in a second, one of those frames is actually going to be correct in terms of the timing on the horse. Mm-hmm. And so timing is everything with, with uh, shooting horses. And as uh, Corinne mentioned, that you need the higher shutter speed, and, um, and then the shutter lag is critical because if, if you're off a millisecond, you miss the shot. Okay. Are the new digital cameras uh, faster? Are they more accurate in terms of timing than the older traditional ones? Well, it, um, it, you know, you, you pay your big money for these high-end cameras because you get such, there's no shutter lag. And, you know, you're also paying for other things. But, you know, that's one thing that you really, um, it, it will vary from camera to camera. But yeah, the higher-end Nikon and Canons are all pretty responsive. And that's one thing that you, as you're looking, shopping around, that you, that's the, probably the first thing, if you're going to be shooting horses, to know that you're going to get pretty instant response time from your shutter. Okay. It's pretty, it really is pretty crucial. All right, so read the manual, step one. Because otherwise you'll just get frustrated to death. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so read the manual. That pretty much eliminates all the guys in the audience, and then... Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you're another thing then, course, you, you've got to read your manual. Sorry, guys. Yeah. <laughs> and that, and the, the part third of thing the, that... Good. Sorry. The third thing that I always tell people is the, the, the lens that you must have if you want to take good horse photos is the 80 to 200 or the 70 to 200 uh, zoom lens. And then when you're shooting horses, you need to be sh- shooting at the end of your 200 millimeter lens so that when you see a lot of amateur horse photos, you see the big head and the little rear end, and that's called lens distortion because you're just shooting too wide. So this can be eliminated if you shoot at the end of your 200 millimeter lens. And what do you lot, mean by that? Now, are, you're you're talking over our heads again. What do you mean by the end of your lens? Well, you've got you've got your focal length is 80 millimeters to 200 millimeters on your zoom lens. If so you do you mean all the way zoomed out? All, all the, the way, way zoomed, zoomed out, to your 200 okay. millimeters. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. And that will reduce your your lens distortion. And you, a lot of people don't want to back up that far because you really do need to back away. You know, the people are shooting too close and too wide, and then you wonder why you're getting this funny looking horse in your photos. That's because you're not zoomed out. So okay. you need to back up and zoom it in, and you'll see a huge. And most people don't your... really see that in their in our brain. If you if you put your hand right in front of your face or move your hand to the length of your arm, in terms of how you really think the size of your hand is. In your brain, it's still the same size. 
but mm-hmm. photographically that that hand would either be very large or very small so the camera doesn't um, you, you have to have some of that compression when you have that long telephoto lens on there to to compress the horse a little bit to make the proportions right do they get the same effect if somebody just has a let's say they have a regular 10 times zoom do they get the same effect would it be the same thing if they're if they're using their that camera the point and shoot kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, the point and shoot. Well, yeah, it depends on your lens, really. And yeah. I mean, the, the rule of thumb is to always zoom to the end of your lens okay. with horses. And a little exercise you can do is to take your take your zoom lens and take your subject and shoot it wide, and then shoot it, you know, whatever your focal lengths are, maybe every thirty or forty millimeters, and then print out those photos and look at them side by side, and then you'll start to see what the distortion is because. Some of it is very subtle, and you won't really see it unless you can compare, you know, 50 millimeters to 200 millimeters. And then you'll realize, you know, what a big difference that can make. So you can't, so you're saying print them out. You you can't tell when you're previewing on the digital camera whether, how well you got that or not? Because I'm thinking, well, let me just take, let me take photographs of this horse 20 times and, and at either at 80 or 200 and somewhere in between and then see what works best. Are you saying that you really can't tell? You need to print out first? Well, it, it, it depends on your angle. I mean, if you're shooting a straight side on shot, you, you, can, you can shoot it pretty wide because you're shooting on one plane. But if you're shooting a three-quarter angle like a headshot where you're shooting, you're standing in, kind of in front of the horse and shooting towards them, that's when you're going to have your lens distortion and when you really need to be shooting at the end of your zoom. Gotcha. So, okay. you know, it's something that you need to practice and get to know how your lens that you're using responds. But a rule of thumb is to really back up and zoom in. Well, that's and, interesting uh, because that's that's against your natural instinct. Yeah, you it need really to be brave is. to do yeah. that. Yeah. Well, that's good. Those were a couple uh, a couple good. I didn't know that. And so. <laughs> Scott also mentioned uh, if you really want to learn how to take good photos, take it out of the motor drive. Just shoot one frame at a time and learn how to time your camera and and not take, you know, just, we call it the spray and pray method. You kind of machine yeah. gun it and hope one turns out. You know, if you want to really learn and grow as a photographer, take it out of motor drive and take one photo at a time. And yeah, I find even... the, only time, the only time I really shoot with my motor drive is when I have some really extreme action going on, like rodeo or, or a horse that's, you know, running and bucking in the pasture or something like that. But usually you just need to take one shot at a time and learn to get your timing. So, and a good it, exercise it's nice to do to get with that. Lazy, but not a good yeah, idea. Yeah, an easy exercise for that is there's something psychological about when you put the lens up to your eye and look for the picture and try and get it as opposed to. I tell people, especially with digital, because it's not hard, just go out and learn timing. Now, that's right. one of the things, too, is when, when, when do you shoot a horse? When, for a trot shot, when's the best time to shoot? And for, it all depends on varying timing, but I, I tell people most of the time in a trot, when that inside leg starts to put weight down on the pasture, and that milliseconds is the ax, and the pasture actually starts to go down, mm. that's when you push the button, somewhere in there. Now, it's going to vary from people, from people to people. Some people will cue on the back legs, but I, I prefer to cue on the front leg. And find that usually for most people to at least get them looking about where to, when to shoot, if they can develop their sense of timing with their camera in that range, as a rule, then that knee is reaching a peak, a peak um, height uh, for that type of shot. Now, dressage is shot a little differently. But one of the things to do is just go out and, and don't put the camera up to your eye. Just look at yourself and go, and in your mind go, now, 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 mm-hmm. now. Uh-huh. And then and then take your then put your finger on your shutter without looking at the horse. Just push the button now, 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 and start yeah, getting I mean, yourself to, to look at the horse. And, and uh, you'll start off looking at that foot, and you eventually look at a point when you you develop after a while. Those of us who have done this, you look at the whole horse when you're shooting. But sounds that's like a, a little Good. It, I was saying it just sounds like you're, it's it's timing and rhythm. It feels like finding it's a rhythm, distance. Rhythm defense. is the key to it, exactly. and every horse Very is a little different. So you do want to watch, but just you know, pointing your camera and shooting blindly is you're never going to get any better. And no. when we were film photographers, we couldn't afford to waste our film, so we needed to take one picture. So you know, you you want to be shooting a high percentage, and it's the same for digital. You don't want to come home with hundreds of photos and only get three keepers. You want to come home with maybe. 15 photos and get three or three to five keepers out of that. So, well, so far, I haven't been doing practice. anything right, Helena. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've well, flunked on you know. every point here. <laughs> so, so Scott, what would you say? What were your what were your things that well, uh, would help? Certainly, the equipment, as as 
Quinn says is absolutely critical. Uh, a couple of things. I was just dropping some notes down. I think the first and foremost thing. But you we have, have to have, assume, though, we do have to assume that not everybody's going to be able to afford the thousand dollar camera. So we have to work with that a little bit. Well, but you know, to tell you the truth, on eBay now, there's a lot of pros that that are getting rid of their their. You know, say I, I shoot the Canon, so you can get some of these uh, an EOS that's two years old. It's great because some guys bumped up to the newest version. You can pick one up for a few right. hundred bucks, and, and they're good cameras. So that's not a bad place to look for cameras. And 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 to answer your original question, no, it's not the camera that makes the picture; it's the eye behind it. And so you could give us, uh, you know, a point and shoot, and we could probably get a good picture. Uh, maybe not the timing we want because of the lag, but you know, the, the camera is a tool, and people have to realize that. Exactly. And it, and and so you have to. You know, learn learn how to use your tool and learn how to get the most out of it. I mean, I've um, just piece, recently picked up a little Canon G10, which has blown me away. It's a 15 megapixel camera. It does all kinds of stuff and has a reasonably um, uh, responsive shutter. And I just threw it in there just to have something small to to carry around. And so. Um, one of the things that, that I also would add to that, and non-equipment-wise, but one of the biggest requirements I think if you're going to photograph a horse is you have to load yourself with patience first. Um, mm -hmm. Horses are incredibly frustrating subjects, and I think if you don't have patience, um, don't even bother trying because which is we're, which is harder, people or horses? Oh, I think horses. Um, um, and from the standpoint of, I can tell a person I want you to go stand over here and they'll stay there and i can try and get a horse to move in that direction and there's some shadow or some sound or some smell that they don't like and and they're going to not want to be there and so you have to be willing to adapt your shoot to what the horse is going to give you so it helps to learn you know to learn the horse's body language read the horse learn what they're saying we have to remember that they're fight or flight animals and it's ironic and so, that that's the same that patience is a rule working with horses no matter what you're doing training exactly and riding. exactly it doesn't matter and, and i mean a, a photo session is very disruptive for everybody it's disruptive for the for the staff it's disruptive for the horses it's disruptive you know nobody's ever glad to see us get there because they've been bathing horses for two or three days and you know schedules are disrupted and and you know we a lot of people they bring horses out and they immediately start making noise or shaking things at them or chasing them or doing something and and you know you you horses again are fight or flight you need to take advantage of learning what what their schedules are and you know i always try and find out when their feeding schedules are you know i i get cranky when i'm hungry so do horses <laughs> and um and i also try and and <clears throat> make certain that um i let them work into this uh and and not just rush out and try and get them to perform um because they are they're athletes there's no question that they're athletes if for if the show horse level but you know they have to warm up to it and i think if you if you take the time and, and patience and what happens is people get frustrated because a horse gets by them or they're not standing upright or you know the worst combination is husband and wife teams because uh, they end up getting in a fight and you know and and horses horses pick up on this stuff they're incredibly sensitive and so i keep my shoots real low key um, we're not, you know, doing anything like solving world hunger or world peace here. We're trying to get a picture of a horse, so it's not that important if we don't get it. Uh, mm -hmm. And and if you know, part of what we are paid to do is to create the environment and use the experience to get the shot. But I think that's where I see a lot of people just get in a hurry and and they don't listen and they don't they don't listen to their horse and they don't read their body language. Yeah, now, I think I think a ahead. critical part of good successful equine photography is knowing horses first, and then knowing how to photograph second. Because I think most of most of the equine photographers I know were horse people first, and that's a huge plus in predicting behavior and and knowing your breed standards and knowing how certain disciplines need to be photographed and so forth. And then also, you know, setting the feet right. And and there's a lot of little details that you learn because you've been around horses. And so, you know, I always tell people that. Well, and know, it's different for every breed. What kind of horse well, shot yeah. you Well, yeah, and, and uh, very often we'll have members say, well, I've got to go shoot this new breed that I've never shot before. And, you know, that that's when you need to study your, your breed standards and, and go, you know, find a magazine and, and see how that breed is being photographed. So, yeah, there's a huge variety in the different disciplines and breeds. And if, you know, you, you need you need to do your homework, basically, if you're going to go shoot something new. Yeah. All right. Let's talk a little yeah. bit about one of the things, too, that I think is a big 
a big error that we all make, and that's framing. Everybody seems to always want to put the main subject right in the middle of the picture, and that's the only thing they ever do. Right. And I know from the little I know about photography, and, and I tend to not be that way, but the little I know about photography is is you can get a much more effective picture if you're not doing that. So t- talk a little bit about that. Well, I find, I, I always tell people, this has changed a little bit from the film days where we wanted to get every photo perfect in the frame. I now tend to, to shoot a little more loosely in the frame, and then when I'm working on my pictures in the in the computer, then I'll put my final crop on them. And, you know, composition is, is important for the final impact, and I think a lot of people miss that that last step but we have so much control now because we do all the work basically in our in our computers we don't leave it to a lab to do it so if we want to crop something a little differently it's not a problem um you know it all comes down to composition and and learning certain little rules i mean it's good to have your whole whole horse in the frame and not cut off its feet and so forth so i think a good rule of thumb is to be shooting a little loosely in the frame so you can crop it later and then also keep in mind if you want to order an 8x10 that you need to keep it within those those uh, dimensions, which, you know... Yeah, we've all made that mistake, cropped it, right. and it, it wasn't 8x10 right. anymore. One of, the, one of the compositional things that I see a lot that, that really hurts people is uh, I'm, a, I'm a big um, use of the, the compositional tool of line, which is, is actual line and implied line. And one of the things you have to watch out with with horses is horizontal lines. And it, it, compositionally, any horizontal line is going to stop the picture right there. Uh, because part of what you're trying to do in, in, in composing a photograph is you're trying to take the eye through the image. I mean, you know, the great master painters of, of, of the, you know, the early, early days would, you know, the compositional tool was very strong and, and the direction of an eye or, or the, the angle of, of a chair or something that, that took you through the picture. But a horizontal line stops the shot. And so um, one, of the, one of the biggest problems that people make shooting horses that I see... What do you mean? Still, the, the horizontal line goes straight across the picture? Is that what yeah, you're talking Yeah, straight across about? the picture, like a fence, okay. uh, a horizon. Um, anything, anything the, 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 compositionally, it's going to stop the eye. It's, it just, if you take a look at a picture of, of a horse, and when you, if you start looking at it with that in mind, take a look at shots where the horses are kind of like the fence is right in the middle of the frame or the horizon is right in the middle of the frame. And basically, you kind of don't take in anything above it. And so um, you need to keep your horizontal lines at a lower or higher level to the horse because they, 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 they just they chop it basically to the horizontal line straight across the picture chops it in two yeah and so um the other thing that along the line of composition that is i see made mistakes both in still and in video is that people don't bend over and you need to shoot into the heart line of the horse so if it's a big trachaner you can stand up but for most horses you're going to have to get down on your knees um minis are almost impossible you shoot on your belly but yep. um, it's, that, is a, that is probably one of the biggest mistakes I see people make is everybody shoots as tall as they are. And what, does that, and what kind of photograph does that produce? Well, what that does is it gives you a little bit of a sense of foreshortening, which means that if you're shooting down on something, it, it tends to make the horse's legs look a little shorter. It's a subtle difference, but if you go out, any, any of your listeners go out there, take a picture of your horse standing up, and, then, and just from the side, just have somebody holding it, and then take a picture of the horse shooting into the heart line, and you will see a huge difference. Hmm. Huge. Yeah, this is a, a big – you see it with, with all sorts of animal photography, like dogs. People are always shooting down at them. You need to get down on the level of the animal, and it's always better to shoot up than to shoot down for the most okay. part, I think. And what about color and light? Let's talk about – when if we're talking about composition, I think with some candids you can capture – something that's there already you know Mm -hmm. if you happen to see the color or you i mean i walk by a scene and i go oh that would make a great photograph Mm -hmm. um how do you capture that what you see with the eye how do you then capture that with your camera well and then and then how do you create it when it's not there (laughs) well why that's i mean that's that's a sixty four thousand dollar question right light light is the photographer's paintbrush (laughs) yeah light is light is our paintbrush light is what creates mood it creates texture it creates uh of course color balance and the you know early morning light and late afternoon light and by early morning we're going to say from a a half hour after sunrise till on an average nine or ten o'clock and in the afternoon from about oh two or three till 
right at right at sunset. That's going to have a very soft quality of light, a very warm quality to it. And as a rule, for for kind of my style of shooting, I shoot early in the morning or late in the afternoon. When I'm outside and start squinting because it's getting too bright, it's time. And my for me, for the kind of work I do, that's when I stop shooting. Mm-hmm. But you, you have to. You, you have to take a look at the direction of light, and, and that's the old rule of thumb from when photography first started was have the sun over your back and so you can illuminate your subject. Well, that was because the, you know, they were using very slow films and huge tripods, but what that is, that's a flat lighting. That's front lighting. There's no shadow. And what we're trying to do, and it's, it, we're trying to take a three-dimensional object and, and communicate to it in a two, and, and a rec- capture it in a two-dimensional field and have it look like it's a three-dimensional object. And so you have to have some degree of shadow in your image to create that depth. And so there's basically four, four primary directions of light. There's front light, which is the light behind you. There's side light, which is coming from the side. There's back light, which is where it's behind you. And then between those, you have a back side light or a, ba- or a side back light and a side front light, which is like a 45-degree angle of, of where your light source is to where you and your subject are. And um, anywhere in that, you know, front light is going to be is going to be very flat and very boring. And a lot of people, you'll see pictures that just don't have any depth to them, and that's why. Um, so the sun was basically what you mean by that is the front light is behind the their back, right behind their back, right. yeah, behind right the over their shoulder, back. yeah, behind, no, yeah, behind, no, behind the photographer's back. In other words, oh, okay. I have a and light that produces... source. That's, yeah, that's front light or flat light. Just figure okay. out there's no shadow. Okay. Now take and go and go 45 degrees to your to your right, and now you're going to start seeing if you take that light source that you're going to start seeing that you've got some shadow now. And that's see, and that's, that's funny. Nice... That that goes against what people's natural tendencies is too, is to sure. try and not have shadows on the subject or right. you know, in the picture. But but shadows are what give you depth. Now, a, a classic backlight, if you think of shots that, that are complete silhouettes, when the sun is right behind them and a horse rears and all you can see is black. I mean, that's, that's called black backlight. And within that venue, I mean, you do things like rim lighting where you try and get a little bit of light. You, if you've gone out into the pastures and your mares are grazing and the sun's kind of behind them and you see a little bit of light filtering through their manes and it's kind of like a little edge of light, that's called rim light. But light, light is everything, and, and I mean, there are seminars taught all over the world for weeks on seeing light, and, and yeah. that is a very critical venue. But a, another quick exercise to, to kind of start looking at things in a different way is take a subject in anywhere, a bale of hay is what I used to take people, take a bale of hay, and take a look at how the light looks at it in the morning, and take a, light, a look at how the light looks at it in the afternoon, and take a, and, in the middle of the day, and see how it changes its shape, its texture, its color. Then walk around the bale of hay and where, where you've got light coming from di- different directions so you can see what it looks like when it's flat and when it looks like from the side, from the back. And you start kind of looking at light in a little bit different way. And so, you know, when I said you walk by someplace and say, well, gosh, that's a pretty picture. Ask yourself why. What time of day is it? What direction is the light? What color is the light? Light has color. In the morning, it's very warm. In the afternoons and higher light, it's very blue. And the original cam- the early digital cameras, we had to white balance them all the time because you had to get the camera to see the color white correctly. And now the auto white balance on all these cameras is very good. Most people don't even think about white balance anymore. Mm-hmm. Plus, you can fix it in Photoshop. But um, <laughs> you know, light light is a it is. I mean, as I said, it's the photographer's paintbrush. It's everything. Another exercise you can do too is if you have a, a, like a if you if you have access to a, a horse being ridden. And take them out in the field in the late afternoon, and then have the horse trot around a big circle around you, and take a photo every two or three strides, and then look at those photos side by side, and see how the light changes. And you'll be surprised. You know, it might not be that sun coming over your your back. It might be, you know, when when the light is hitting them on the side, where you, as Scott says, you have much more of a, a sculpting effect with the shadows. So it's really, I mean, it's it's a constant study, and it takes a long time to start seeing seeing the light and the nice thing about digital is that you can experiment and play more you know you don't feel like you're wasting film and, and you can be more creative and, and try new things and light really is everything as far as it's everything and, and i yep and i learned lighting basically by studying the old hollywood photo shots uh, of movie sets and glamour shots and, and i'd start looking at pictures and try and figure out how they lit it and why did i like it and, mm-hmm. and, you know, what, what made that shot. And, and do the same thing. I mean, when you look through your horse magazines or any magazine, if a picture stops you, um, and, again, and, and in my context, I'm an advertising shooter, so part of my job is to try and create images that get your attention. So if, if, if you are stopped by a picture, ask yourself why. What is it about that picture that made you look at it? 
And, and, and another thing to remember, too, is you don't have to have a sunny day to make good pictures. No, I mean, you don't Bright overcast all. is probably the best light you can have because you're not dealing with any kind of shadows, and you can shoot in any direction, and it's beautiful for portraits because, you know, mm -hmm. you, you don't have a shadow under the hat or, right. you know, the wrinkles aren't quite as obvious. So, you know, even in the rain, you can take pictures. if you. Yeah, can you can take pictures in all right. situations. Uh, light will have direction no matter – it's going to have direction and quality no matter how much of it there is. Right, um, so it, it does sound a, like a lighting. Sunny, a sunny day is almost like a curse for photographers because, yeah. especially yeah. with the digital cameras, they can't really handle that. The bright to the dark is right. very tough for the digital cameras to handle. So I'm much happier when it's bright overcast if I have to be shooting, to be honest. So it sounds like lighting is top on the list of of things Absolutely. to worry about, even as a as a neophyte photographer. Learning to see it is the, is the key, and it's and that yeah. it's it's. I've kind of learned you've either got a knack for seeing light or you don't. I mean, I've I've got a good friend that's a very good photographer, and she's she's a doctor, but she she laughs and she says, you know, I've taken courses and I still can't see light. Well, she can see it better than <laughs> she can see it better than she thinks. But. Well, that that's well, a good question though. Is how how much of a good photographer is 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 something they've learned, or is it just talent that's there, like a good painter? I think a lot of it is very instinctive and a, and a certain talent to be creative and artistic. We have members that grow by leaps and bounds, and just right from the beginning, they've got an incredible eye. And then there's others that struggle with it all their lives. And I mean, I it, you know, people will argue with you and tell you that photography is not an art, but it really is. And as Scott says, the camera is just a tool that you learn how to use, and you know, it's a means of expression of your creativity. And, you know, everybody expresses it a little differently. So um, learning to use that tool to, to you know, your the optimal ability is really the key. And then once you do that, then you can kind of get creative. But I think a lot of people do want to cut corners with these digital cameras and not really understand what their cameras are doing. So. Well, you know what? It, if it wasn't an art, that's kind of silly because then there you wouldn't have – everybody would be a professional photographer if it wasn't well, an art. Well, and, and the really funny thing is that we have artists contact us wanting to copy our work. <laughs> so I think photography is an art. But <laughs> So let me ask – I'll get more practical here. We're coming up on the holidays. If somebody wanted to get a portrait done of their horse or for somebody else, what would they pay? Well, on average, what I know it, it's going to vary, but just a, a ballpark. Oh boy, that's a good question. I mean, that's it, a depends, question. it depends on a lot I know of that's factors. why I asked it. I mean, you I think we've been too easy on you guys. Yeah, a photographers <laughs> in our business will will do it one of two ways. They'll have okay. a, a sitting fee that includes um a, an, a a print or they'll have a, a fee for shooting uh, on a per horse basis or they'll have an hourly rate or they'll have a daily rate that's a minimum fee um plus prints plus whatever. But you can yeah, I mean, you can be off. looking at a, at a hundred and fifty dollars to fifteen hundred dollars. It really depends on a a lot of Just factors. You know who who the photographer is, what you end up buying. You know, um, but I would and, say and an you know, you can, Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. You, you, you know, you can shop around, and I think that the most critical thing is to, to look at what the photographer's already produced and to see if that's what you have in mind, because, you know, the higher-end photographers all have their own certain style, and in the end, it really isn't about the money so much as the end product, you know, a, a photo that you want to hang on your wall and will be a memory. And with horses, you know, the, the only memories we really have after they die is those photos, and I think Scott can say the same thing. Every so often we'll get a call or an email from someone that really says that, you know, that photo is all they have left of that horse. And, and so you're, you're not really buying a print. You're buying a memory, and, and it's a whole emotional tie that we have to these animals, which is very important. So, I mean, you know, you, you can do your homework and, and check and see who's around in your area, what, you know, you're going to be pay, paying for the travel fees and the – the session fee, and you'd probably be surprised that if you can find someone local, you can probably um, get get a get a good photo and product, probably all told for between four and five hundred dollars. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's, it'd be about it'd be about like a portrait studio, to tell you the truth. Right. Okay. Um, all right, you know. Scott, uh, I'll tell you what, you have to get off to Dubai, and, and we're plain running out of time. We could sit and talk like this for four hours, I think. Yeah, we That's, could. 
<laughs> we just Good. touched on the surface. Scott, you have to promise me one thing, though. Yes. And that is you'll probably be coming down here when your exhibit opens at the Kentucky Horse Park. I will, Park. absolutely. Um, I'm actually going to the, – the show actually opens in March. Okay. But, uh, and I was going to fly back for it, but they asked if I would uh, tie it into an Arabian Horse event that's going to be going on in June. So the actual artist reception is going to be in June. So, well, let me know um, so I can come over. Absolutely. Maybe we'll do an in-person interview. We'll sit down again. Uh, Wonderful. I'll, I'll just Wonderful. head over to the park. That'll be great. Well, we appreciate you being on with us and helping us out in this conversation. I actually have more than 10 things written down. Okay. I, I, I could add one more, one more thing very quickly. Okay. And that is one of the things that people need to also realize is when a horse is done, it's done. And one of the biggest problems I see is horses. People keep pushing horses to try and get a picture when they have nothing left to give them. Okay. Well, horses are like two-year-olds. They only have about a 10-minute at- attention span. At yeah, that, that's so. about it. I mean, even yeah. a finely tuned oh, so, they're so they're like hu- husbands, too. We have a 10-minute <laughs> attention yeah. span, and when we're done, we're done. We're done, we're done. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's good advice even and if you're riding with, one. <laughs> with horses, I think expression is everything. You can take a good photo, but the really dynamite photos are the ones that show expression. So that's what yeah. we as photographers are always looking for, that, that split-second moment where the horse is flaring his nostrils and giving us that look. And, you know, that's, that's always what you're working towards, and you're lucky when you can capture it with your camera. All right, good. Well, Scott, thank you very much again. Yeah, my and, pleasure. Uh, Thanks for having me we'll, on the show. We'll talk to you soon. Have fun in Dubai. I'll do it. All right, let's get Tom Mahan on here. He's of Porter's Cameras, and actually, if you go to, if you go to Google and search for cameras, Porter's comes up near the top, and I bought some things from him in the past, which is why I thought of having them on. Uh, Tom, tell us a little bit about Porter's Cameras. Well, uh, Porter's has been around uh, for, you know, 40-some or 40 some years or, or longer, depending on if you go back to when the, there was a studio first, you know, uh, guy by the name of Frank Porter uh, had a portrait studio here in Cedar Falls, Iowa, where we're located. And it kind of progressed from there to, from, from a retail, from a, the studio to a retail store. And then we grew into a catalog uh, outlet or catalog store or fulfillment center and uh, retail, and now, of course, we're, we're on the web, and we still have the catalog, which a lot of people still enjoy. Uh, we have a, a lot of uh, uh, customers that, that have been with us for many, many years and enjoy getting that catalog. We've got over 4,700 or 4,700 products in that catalog uh, to choose from. So, so you know, a lot of people think of us, you know, when they can't find something, if it's a odd uh, or hard to get item for photography. Uh, there's a good chance that, that we're going to have it. Uh, we now have uh, retail stores here in Cedar Falls, and then we also have one in, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, which is about 45 miles from from where we're at. Uh, but again, we've got uh, the, the two retail stores, and then and then we're basically worldwide with uh, with the uh, internet and, and in our catalog. And it's Porters.com. P O R. Port- Yes, porters.com. P-O-R-T-E-R-S.com. That's correct. All right. Well, we had you on today because we wanted to we wanted to get some recommendations from you for a couple of cameras that people could buy for people for the holidays. All right. For a gift. So what what have you got that you think would be a, a good gift? Maybe something in the reasonable price range and then something that's really fun. Okay. All right. Well, um, we can start off with with a uh, a point and shoot camera, you know, and and I would probably you, you kind of have to be careful with this as far as uh, what type of pictures or, or the environment where you're going to be located. Uh, with a point and shoot camera, and I'm talking about a camera in the in the $250 range or $350 range. If you don't have a lot of light, you're probably not going to have um, very good success, you know, taking a, an action picture. For your inside arenas and so forth, they generally aren't going to give you enough light, and you're going to get blurry pictures. So lighting is the key. Um, and again, if you've got lots of you know sunshine and, and so forth, you should be able to get fairly good results with a point-and-shoot camera. And because there is uh, what's kind of you know called a shutter lag with a point-and-shoot camera. Boy, have we heard uh, all this t- earlier today? <laughs> we learned about shutter lag. We learned about. We know shutter what you're lag. talking about. Yeah, we okay. actually know about it now. <laughs> all right, uh, you guys just, have got just, to be real experts. Yeah, now. we're good. <laughs> that's that's good. That's good. Um, one thing you might want, and maybe I'm repeating some things that that came up earlier, but um, if if you are using a point-and-shoot camera. Uh, one thing that you might want to do, rather than trying to follow the, the uh, action around, pre-focus on us on an area, 
and then let your action or let the horse move into that area. And I was going to ask system. you that, Kareen, earlier, and I, we just never got to it. So it, it, it's better not to follow the subject like the horse, in this case, they're going over a jump. It's better to focus on the jump and wait for them to come to you. Well, no, with with the higher end DSLRs that the pros and the advanced amateurs are using, um, the, you have different kinds of focusing systems, and the, there there's a continuous focusing system which you can use, so you can follow the action and and okay. hopefully stay focused. But with all your the point time. and shoot, you want to focus on the the jump, let's say. Yeah, 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 you want to plan ahead a little bit because yeah, okay. like you described, right? Gotcha. So, yeah, Tom, yeah. Uh, what's a good point and shoot then? Well, one one of the ones that I recommended um, is a, a Canon SX110 IS. It's got um, it, it sells for around two hundred and fifty dollars. It's um, got image stabilization. Um, it's an eight megapixel camera with a ten time zoom. Um, and I want to mention to everybody, we'll actually put links on our show notes at uh, stablescoop.com on the show notes for this episode. We'll put links to your website so and a picture there so they can find it. Okay, great. And that was a uh, Canon SX one hundred and ten IS, and I assume that stands for image stabilization. That is that is correct. Okay. So the, so that might in in some cases might help you um, with with low light. Um, it stabilizes you. It does not stabilize. You know, it doesn't doesn't do anything if your subject is moving. So again, um, you know, if you've got low light and and you've got fast action, it's going to be tough to to get a, a good picture. Um, but again, for if you're dealing with outside pictures with with a lot of light, um, this I think you get pretty good results. Okay. Uh, so does that does that point and shoot camera give you any control over your shutter speed or what? Yes, it yes it does. Action? Yes, oh, it that's does. Good. And Great. and you're always going to get best results if you can take your camera off the auto mode. Oh, here I go again. <laughs> I'm having heart attacks <laughs> here, people. What? <laughs> but I mean, it's not that difficult. <laughs> but, but there's there's some controls that you can that you can uh, you know choose to to use, such as your ISO settings and mm-hmm. your aperture settings. That's going to allow you to take. Um, a moving picture, an action picture in low light. All right, so, and that one you well, said ran a couple hundred bucks then? $250, yep. All right, so that's certainly affordable for anybody. Now, I assume on this one you can't change out lenses or put additional. It's just what it is. It is what it is. That's okay. that's correct. And, and what's the zoom on that one? That is a 10 times zoom. 10 times digital? Ten, no, optical zoom. Optical zoom, which is what you want to look for. That's what you want to. That's what you want exactly. Yeah, that's that's a big difference. People don't realize is you, you'll see ten times digital zoom. You want to look for a. Uh, you want to look for optical zoom. Right. Uh, the more optical zoom, the better. Okay. Now, if we're going to go up in level, then. If we're going to go up in level, um, I think uh, you know you in the price range of five to six hundred dollars. You're, you should be able to find, uh, you know, the, like a Canon Rebel XS or a Nikon D60. Those are cameras that are 10 megapixels, um, three frames per second, um, the uh, a 1600 ISO. And with both those options, you're going to get an image stabilization uh, lens, not a, not a real uh, long telephoto lens by any means. Um, you sh- in, the, in that price range, around the $600 mark, you should be able to get um, an 18 to 55 image stabilization lens. Um, but again, you're going to have the SLR advantage there that um, you know you can't get with a point and shoot. And can you You're change just... lenses on those cameras? You can, right? Yes, you can. Yes, yeah. you can. And and that's going to give you some some growth. You're going to get sharper and more accurate focusing and metering with with that type of camera. Um, much faster focusing than a point and shoot, and and you're going to eliminate that shutter lag. Okay, and that's the Canon Rebel XS and the Nikon D60. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yep. And then if we're going to go all out. If you're going to go all out, you know, one one example is you can take that same system that, you know, take your Rebel XS or your Nikon D60 and add a fast lens to that. Uh, an example of that would be a Tamron 70-200 to F2.8 lens. Yeah, um, that's the lens that we really need for horses is the 80-200 to 2.8 lens. And... Yep, yep. So, so, so you can add, you know, by adding $700 onto those cameras that we just talked about, now you've got a high-end system with a fast lens, fast focusing, you know, great in low light situations. Yeah. And they, you know, the the best thing I think too is is don't necessarily go online. They can call you directly, and you can talk to. They can say, "I'm a horse person. This is what I do," and you'll guide them through this stuff. 
That's that's right. That's one of the advantages of, of, of that I think we have with porters is that uh, people can deal with, with real people and, and people that have have some experience and and, and you have no horses in Iowa whatsoever so <laughs> <laughs> we we do have you know quite a few I know. Uh, you customers do. you know that that are into, into the horses and and so we we do have some experience you know in helping them and that's why we kind of know from experience you know that you know they they've come into us with their point and shoot cameras and said you know this What's doesn't work. Worth this, crap. Does, this doesn't work. And, you know, we say, yes, it, it, you're right. It doesn't. <laughs> so, all right, now let's just go all out with the we'll end on this. If I want to buy my wife the nicest camera and I just, I don't care if I spend two, three thousand bucks, but I want a good one. Okay. Well, I mean, you could go, um, you know, with the, with the Nikon, you know, the, the 700, uh, as was mentioned earlier, you could go with the Nikon D90, uh, the, the, uh, Canon Rebel uh, 50D are all priced. For, you know, there you're looking at bodies anywhere from you know thirteen hundred dollars to sixteen hundred dollars up to the you know uh, twenty five hundred dollar range, and then and then your your lens is going to have to you know go on that. So you know whether you choose so something see, like this. See that my Canon theory. Lens. My theory on that, Tom, is at least I'll look like I know what I'm doing. Well. I... <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's Once very true. Once you start shooting with those big lenses, then you seem to attract a lot of attention. Well, that's right. I'll just look cool. Yeah. My yeah, pictures are still pictures, stink, pictures, but I'll look cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we have to wrap it up here. We're plain running out of time. Uh, Tom is Porters, P-O-R-T-E-R-S dot com, right? That's correct. Yeah. All right. We appreciate you being on with us today, and, and uh, thanks a lot. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me. All right, Karine and Helena, we have to wrap it up here today. This has been so much fun after the last couple of weeks. I mean, the last couple of weeks' shows were very interesting and informative, but they weren't a whole lot of fun. So uh, <laughs> this was fun. Uh, you know, and, and it's You're been such a, a geek, Glenn. I know, I know, I know. I'm I am. such a geek. You were talking about stuff, you know, cool stuff now. We're talking about things you can play with. You got so into it when you guys were talking about just buzzwords that went right over my head. You, That's when you really <laughs> dug your heels in and geeked out. <laughs> In case you guys are ever wondering why we call him Glenn the Geek. That's right. That's why. I'm yeah, sorry. but I'm surprised if he's a geek that he's shooting in auto mode. That's just a such oh, a... Oh, yeah, but oh, I'm... Oh, that's I'm a, a good one. Oh, uh, that, that does hurt. That hurts. <laughs> get off mo- we got to get off auto mode. Now, know. let's make t-shirts. You know what that means? Auto- that means I have to read the darn book again. Yeah, go read your book and take it out of auto. And, then, and I, you then know, it wouldn't, back. it wouldn't hurt, too. And I recommend this for everybody. Take a photography class. That would help. And also, if you don't have any experience using Photoshop or one of the other programs, take an on, there are lots of online courses. Take one on that, too. I actually don't use Photoshop because it was so expensive when I started doing this. I got right. used to PaintShop Pro, which is a, which is a carbon copy of yep. Photoshop, and it's much cheaper. Yep. So take online courses. Learn how to use that. That's probably as important as taking the pictures in the first place. Definitely. Kareen yeah. can be found at equinephotographers.net. Uh, what else? Org. Or .org. .org, sorry. And what other, what, your other websites were? Um, my personal website is imageequine.com, and then I also have another site called horsedrivephotos.com. Oh, that was amazing, by the way. Horse Drive Photos. We won't go okay. into it. We don't have time, but I love the photos there. Well, check us out online, and we invite people to join us uh, at e- EPNet. All right, good. And Helena, next week we are going to have more fun shows. We're going to actually be doing two next week, one on English equestrian gifts and one on Western equestrian gifts. And I can't wait because you're going to have fun with that because then we're going to be talking about your kind of fun, gifty stuff too. Yeah, it's shopping. It's yeah, shopping. shopping. Yes, that's going to be a lot of fun. Don't forget our show notes at StableScoop.com. We'll actually put down the 10 top uh, hints that we have for taking a good horse photo that we put together today. We'll put that on our show notes for this episode. And you also can give send us feedback or a voicemail at 270-803-0025 or email us at geeks at horseradionetwork.com. All right, Helena, we'll see you again next week as we go shopping. And we'll be here with the scoop.